Hey everybody, we're uh, we're back up again, and we're gonna have some more uh, fun uh, classic science fiction tonight. So um, uh, I'd just like to uh, start with a little bit of uh, explanation tonight because um, this is something that uh, I'm gonna be starting to do. I w I started doing this uh, for you know just a little bit of fun, but. Um, uh, I actually, uh, a lot of you know, I, I work at the uh, Brentwood Public Library in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, we are uh, obviously shut down right now because of the whole uh, whole coronavirus thing. So we're trying to find uh, different ways to engage the public and um, continue to uh, provide the services that we do. And uh, we had a we had a meeting today, and uh, we actually discussed a little bit the fact that I've started doing this. And uh, we've come to the conclusion that this is a good project to uh, cross post to uh, that page as well. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to work with Facebook Live to make it um, stream both places at the same time. I'm not sure if that's even something you can do. But um, uh, uh, until I figure it out, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to do the live stream on my own page so that uh, people can see that. And then I'm going to share it directly onto the uh, the Brentwood Library page so uh, people can uh, view and continue to do this. I'm going to be sharing the first two that I did um, probably later on, and then uh, this one as well, just so everybody has the full story. So uh, the, it's nice how uh, my, my work and um, my uh, interests are coinciding very nicely with this, uh, this particular project. So, uh, just to catch everybody uh, up to speed, I mean, a lot of you keep keep coming back and everything, but to catch everybody up to speed, um, so where we're at right now is um, we uh, had some, they haven't even gotten to the desert planet yet. They're still preparing to leave, and we're meeting all our supporting cast, and uh, Paul is uh, having these weird visions of a place he's never seen, and a girl he doesn't know. So it's it's all a whole thing, and he was tested, and he might be something that's called the uh, Kwisatz Haderach, and uh, we're gonna figure out what that is in time, but you know it's it's gonna take a little bit. So I'm probably gonna do um, two chapters tonight, just because I looked ahead a little bit, and uh, the two chapters that we've got coming up, they're uh, they're both uh, fairly fairly short, and they both you know are on the theme of meeting uh, different members of. Uh, Paul's retinue, Paul's groupies, whatever you want to call it. So, um, <laughs> so without further ado, and of course the cat starts playing with a jingly ball right uh, when we're ready to go, uh, we are going to hop in with uh, Chapter 4. All right. You have read that Muad'Dib had no playmates his own age on Caladan. The dangers were too great. But Muad'Dib did have wonderful companion teachers. There was Gurney Halleck, the troubadour warrior. You will sing some of Gurney's songs as you read along in this book. There was Thufer Hawat, the old Mentat master of assassins, who struck fear even into the heart of the Padishah Emperor. There was Duncan Idaho, the sword master of the Ganaz, Dr. Wellington Yui, a name black in treachery but bright in knowledge. The Lady Jessica, who guided her son in the Bene Gesserit way. And of course, the Duke Leto, whose qualities as a father have long been overlooked. From a Child's History of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan. Thufir Hawat slipped into the training room of Castle Caladan and closed the door softly. He stood there a moment, feeling old and tired and storm-leathered. His left leg ached where it had been slashed once in the service of the old duke. Three generations of them now, he thought. He stared across the big room, bright with the light of noon pouring through the skylights, saw the boy seated with back to the door, intent on papers and charts spread all across an L table. How many times must I tell that lad never to settle himself with his back to a door? Hawat cleared his throat. Paul remained bent over his studies. A cloud shadow passed over the skylights. Again, Hawat cleared his throat. Paul straightened, spoke without turning. 
I know, I'm sitting with my back to a door. Pawat suppressed a smile, strode across the room. Paul looked up at the grizzled old man who stopped at a corner of the table. Pawat's eyes were two pools of alertness in a dark and deeply seamed face. I heard you coming down the hall, Paul said, and I heard you open the door. The sounds I make could be imitated. I'd know the difference. He might at that, Pawat thought. That witch mother of his is giving him the deep training, certainly. I wonder what her precious school thinks of that. Maybe that's why they sent the old proctor here, to whip our dear Lady Jessica into line. Hawat pulled up a chair across from Paul, sat down facing the door. He did it pointedly, leaned back and studied the room. It struck him as an odd place suddenly, a stranger place with most of its hardware already gone off to Arrakis. A training table remained and a fencing mirror with its crystal prisms quiescent. The target dummy beside it patched and padded, looking like an ancient foot soldier, maimed and battered in the wars. There stand I, Hawat thought. Thufir, what are you thinking? Paul asked. Hawat looked at the boy. I was thinking that we'll all be out of here soon and likely never see the place again. Does that make you sad? Sad nonsense. Parting with friends is a sadness. The place is only a place. He glanced at the charts on the table. And Arrakis is just another place. Did my father send you up to test me? Hawat scowled. The boy had such observing ways about him. He nodded. You're thinking it'd have been nicer if he'd come up himself, but you must know how busy he is. He'll come along later. I've been studying about the storms on Arrakis. The storms, I see. They sound pretty bad. That's too cautious a word, bad. Those storms build up across six or seven thousand kilometers of flatlands, feed on anything that can give them a push. Coriolis force, other storms, anything that has an ounce of energy in it. They can blow up to 700 kilometers an hour, loaded with everything loose that's in their way. Sand, dust, everything. They can eat flesh off bones and etch the bones to slivers. Why don't they have weather control? Arrakis has special problems. Costs are higher, and there'd be maintenance and the like. The guild wants a dreadful high price for a satellite control, and your father's house isn't one of the big rich ones, lads. You, you know that. Have you ever seen the Fremen? The lad's mind is darting all over today, Watt thought. Like as not I have seen them, he said. There's little to tell them from the folk of the Graben and Sink. They all wear those great flowing robes, and they stink to heaven in any closed space. It's from those suits they wear, call them still suits, that reclaim the body's own water. Paul swallowed, suddenly aware of the moisture in his mouth, remembering a dream of thirst. That people could want so for water they had to recycle their body moisture struck him with a feeling of desolation. Water's precious there, he said. Hawat nodded, thinking, perhaps I'm doing it, getting across to the importance of this planet as an enemy. It's madness to go in there without a, that caution in our minds. Paul looked at the skylight, aware that it had begun to rain. He saw the spreading wetness on the gray metaglass. Water, he said. You'll learn a great concern for water, Hawat said. As the Duke's son, you'll never want for it, but you'll see the pressures of thirst all around you. Paul wet his lips with his tongue, thinking back to the day a week ago and the ordeal with the Reverend Mother. She, too, had said something about water starvation. You'll, you'll learn about the funeral planes, she'd said, about the wilderness that is empty, the wasteland where nothing lives except the spice and the sandworms. You'll stain your eye pits to reduce the sun glare. Shelter will mean a hollow out of the wind and hidden from view. You'll ride upon your own two feet without thopter or ground car or mount. And Paul had been caught more by her tone than by her words. When you live on Arrakis, she had said, the land is empty. The moons will be your friends, the sun your enemy. Paul had sensed his mother come up beside them from her post guarding the door. She had looked at the Reverend Mother and asked, Do you see no hope, your reverence? Not for the father. And the old woman had waved Jessica to silence, looking down at Paul. Grave this on your memory, lad. 
A world is supported by four things. She held up four big knuckled fingers. The learning of the wise, the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, and the valor of the brave. But all of these are as nothing, she closed her fingers into a fist, without a ruler who knows the art of ruling. Make that the science of your tradition. A week had passed since that day with the Reverend Mother. Her words were only now beginning to come into full register. Now, sitting in the training room with Thufir Hawat, Paul felt a sharp pang of fear. He looked across at the Mentat's puzzled frown. Where were you wool gathering this time? Hawat asked. Did you meet the Reverend Mother? That truth-sayer witch from the Imperium? Hawat's eyes quickened with interest. I met her. She... Paul hesitated, found that he couldn't tell Hawat about the ordeal. The inhibitions went deep. Yes, what did she? Paul took two deep breaths. She said a thing. He closed his eyes, calling upon the words, and when he spoke, his voice unconsciously took on some of the old woman's tone. You, Paul Atreides, descendant of kings, son of a duke, you must learn to rule. It's something none of your ancestors learn. Paul opened his eyes, said, that made me angry, and I said, my father rules an entire planet. And she said, he's losing it. And I said, my father was getting a richer planet. And she said, he'll lose that one too. And I wanted to run and warn my father, but she said he'd already been warned. By you, by mother, by many people. True enough, Watt muttered. Then why are we going? Paul demanded. Because the emperor ordered it and because there's hope in spite of what that witch spy said. What else spouted from that ancient fountain of wisdom? Paul looked down at his right hand, clenched into a fist beneath the table. Slowly, he willed the muscles to relax. She put some kind of hold on me, he thought. How? She asked me to tell her what it is to rule, Paul said, and I said that one commands, and she said that I had some unlearning to do. She hit a mark right enough, Hawat thought. He nodded for Paul to continue. She said a ruler must learn to persuade and not to compel. She said he must lay the best coffee hearth to attract the finest men. How'd you figure your father attracted men like Duncan and Gurney? Hawat asked. Paul shrugged. Then she said a good ruler has to learn his world's language, that it's different for every world. And I thought she meant they didn't speak Galak on Arrakis, but she said that wasn't it at all. She said she meant the language of the rocks and the growing things, the language you don't hear just with your ears. And I said that's what Dr. Yui calls the mystery of life. Hawat chuckled. <laughs> that's it with her. I think she got mad. She said the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. So I quoted the first law of Mentat at her. A process cannot be understood by stopping it. Understanding must move with the flow of the process, must join it and flow with it. That seemed to satisfy her. He seems to be getting over it, Hawat thought. But that old witch frightened him. Why did she do it? Thufir, Paul said, will Arrakis be as bad as she said? Nothing could be that bad, Hawat said and forced a smile. Take those Fremen, for example, the renegade people of the desert. By first approximation analysis, I can tell you there are many, many more of them than the Imperium suspects. People live there, lad. A great many people, and... Hawat put a sinewy finger beside his eye. They hate Harkonnens with a bloody passion. You must not breathe a word of this, lad. I tell you only as your father's helper. My father has told me of Seleucus Secundus. Paul said. Do you know, Thufir, it sounds much like Arrakis. Perhaps not as bad, but much like it. We do not really know of Salasa Secundus today, only what it was like long ago, mostly. But what is known, you're right on that score. Will the Fremen help us? It's a possibility. Hawat stood up. I leave today for Arrakis. Meanwhile, you take care of yourself for an old man who's fond of you, eh? Come around here like the good lad you are and sit facing the door. It's not that I think there's any danger in the castle. It's just a habit I want you to form. Paul got to his feet, moved around the table. You're going today? 
Today it is, and you will be following tomorrow. Next time we meet, it'll be on the soil of your new world. He gripped Paul's right arm at the bicep. Keep your knife arm free, eh? And your shield at full charge. He released the arm, patted Paul's shoulder, whirled and strode quickly to the door. Thufir, Paul called. The Watt turned, standing in the open doorway. Don't sit with your back to any doors, Paul said. A grin spread across the seamed old face. That I won't, lad. Depend on it. And he was gone, shutting the door softly behind. Paul sat down where Hawat had been, straightened the papers. One more day here, he thought. He looked around the room. We're leaving. The idea of departure was suddenly more real to him than it had ever been before. He recalled another thing the old woman had said about a world being the sum of many things. The people, the dirt, the growing things, the moons, the tides, the suns. The unknown sum called nature, a vague summation without any sense of the now. And he wondered, what is the now? The door across from Paul banged open and an ugly lump of a man lurched through it, preceded by a handful of weapons. Well, Gurney Halleck, Paul called. Are you the new weapons master? Halleck kicked the door shut with one heel. You'd rather I came to play games, I know, he said. He glanced around the room, noting that Hawat's men had already been over it, checking, making it safe for a duke's heir. The subtle code signs were all around. Paul watched the rolling, ugly man set himself back in motion, veer toward the training table with the load of weapons, saw the nine-string balisette strung over Gurney's shoulder with the multi-pick woven through the strings near the head of the fingerboard. Halleck dropped the weapons on the exercise table, lined them up. The rapiers, the bodkins, the kinjals, the slow pellet stunners, the shield belts. The inkvine scar along his jawline writhed as he turned, casting a smile across the room. So you don't even have a good morning for me, you young imp, Alex said. And what barb did you sink in old Awat? He passed me in the hall like a man running to his enemy's funeral. Paul grinned. Of all his father's men, he liked Gurney Halleck best. Knew the man's moods and deviltry his humors, and thought of him more as a friend than a hired sword. Halleck swung the balisette off his shoulder, began tuning it. If you won't talk, you won't, he said. Paul stood, advanced across the room, calling out, Well, Gurney, do we come prepared for music when it's fighting time? So it's sass for our elders today, Halleck said. He tried a chord on the instrument, nodded. Where's Duncan Idaho? Paul asked. Isn't he supposed to be teaching me weaponry? Duncan's gone to lead the second wave onto Arrakis, Halleck said. All you have left is poor Gurney, who's fresh out of fight and spoiling for music. He struck another chord, listened to it, smiled. And it was decided in council that you being such a poor fighter, we'd best teach you the music trade so you won't waste your life entire. Maybe you'd better sing me a lay then, Paul said. I want to be sure how not to do it. Ah, ha, ha, Gurney laughed, and he swung into Galatian Girls, his multi-pick a blur over the strings as he sang. Not bad for such a poor hand with the pick, Paul said, but if my mother heard you singing a body like that in the castle, she'd have your ears out on the outer wall for decoration. Gurney pulled at his left ear. Poor decoration, too. They haven't been bruised so much listening to keyholes while a young lad I know practiced some strange ditties on his balisette. So you've forgotten what it's like to find sand in your bed, Paul said. He pulled a shield belt from the table, buckled it fast around his waist. Then let's fight. Halleck's eyes went wide in mock surprise. So it was your wicked hand did that deed? Guard yourself today, young master, guard yourself. He grabbed up a rapier, laced the air with it. I'm a hell fiend out for revenge. Paul lifted the companion rapier, Bent it in his hand, stood in the aguil, one foot forward. His manner goes solemn in a comic imitation of Dr. Yue. What a dolt my father sends me for weaponry, Paul intoned. This doltish gurney Halleck has forgotten the first lesson for a fighting man armed and shielded. Paul snapped the force button at his waist, felt the crinkled skin tingling of the defensive field at his forehead and down his back heard external sounds take on characteristic shield-filtered flatness. In shield fighting, one moves fast on defense, slow on attack, Paul said. 
Attack has the sole purpose of tricking the opponent into a misstep, setting him up for the attack sinister. The shield turns a fast blow, admits the slow knife. Paul snapped up the rapier, fainted fast, and whipped it back for a slow thrust. Time to enter a shield's mindless defenses. Halleck watched the action, turned at the last minute to let the blunted blade pass his chest. Speed, excellent, he said, but you were wide open for an underhanded counter with a slip tip. Paul stepped back, chagrined. I should whip your backside for such carelessness, Halleck said. He lifted a naked kinjal from the table and held it up. This, in the hand of an enemy, can let out your life's blood. You're an apt pupil, none better. But I've warned you that not even in play do you let a man inside your guard with death in his hand. I guess I'm not in the mood for it today, Paul said. Mood! Halleck's voice betrayed his outrage even through the shield's filtering. What has mood got to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle or making love or playing the balisette. It's not for fighting. I'm sorry, Gurney. You're not sorry enough. Alec activated his own shield, crouched with Kinjal out thrust in left hand, the rapier poised high in his right. Now I say, guard yourself for true. He leaped high to one side, then forward, pressing a furious attack. Paul fell back, parrying. He felt the field crackling as shield edges touched and repelled each other, sensed the electric tingling of the contact along his skin. What's gotten into Gurney? He asked himself. He's not faking this. Paul moved his left hand, dropped his bodkin into his palm from its wrist sheath. You see the need for an extra blade, eh? Halleck grunted. Is this betrayal? Paul wondered. Surely not Gurney. Around the room they fought, thrust and parry, faint and counterfeint. The air within their shield bubbles grew stale from the demands on it that the slow interchange along barrier edges could not replenish. With each new shield contact, the smell of ozone grew stronger. Paul continued to back, but now he directed his retreat toward the exercise table. If I can turn him beside the table, I'll show him a trick, Paul thought. One more step, Gurney. Halleck took the step. Paul directed a parry downward, turned, saw Halleck's rapier catch against the table's edge. Paul flung himself aside, thrust high with rapier, and came in across Halleck's neckline with the bodkin. He stopped the blade an inch from the jugular. Is this what you seek? Paul said. Look down, lad, Gurney panted. Paul obeyed, saw Halleck's kinjal thrust under the table's edge, the tip almost touching Paul's groin. We'd have joined each other in death, Halleck said, but I'll admit you fought some better when pressed to it. You seem to get the mood. And he grinned wolfishly, the inkvine scar rippling across his jaw. The way you came at me, Paul said, would you really have drawn my blood? Halleck withdrew the kinjal, straightened. If you'd fought one whit beneath your abilities, I'd have scratched you a good one, a scar you'd remember. But I'll not have my favorite pupil fall to the first Harkonnen tramp who happens along. Paul deactivated his shields, leaned on the table to catch his breath. I deserve that, Gurney, but it would have angered my father if you'd hurt me. I'll not have you punished for my failing. As to that, Halleck said, it was my failing too. And you needn't worry about a training scar or two. You're lucky you have so few. As to your father, the Duke could punish me if I failed to make a first-class fighting man out of you. And I'd have been failing there if I hadn't explained the fallacy in this mood thing you suddenly developed. Paul straightened, slipped his bodkin back into its wrist sheath. It's not exactly play we do here. Paul nodded. He felt a sense of wonder at the uncharacteristic seriousness in Halleck's manner, the sobering intensity. He looked at the beet-colored inkvine scar on the man's jaw, remembering the story of how it had been put there by Beast Raban in a Harkonnen slave pit on Gidi Prime, and Paul felt the sudden shame that he had doubted Halleck even for an instant. It occurred to Paul then that the making of Halleck's scar had been accompanied by pain, a pain as intense, perhaps, as that inflicted by a reverend mother. He thrust this thought aside. It chilled their world. I guess I did hope for some play today, Paul said. Things are so serious around here lately. Halleck turned away to hide his emotions. Something burned in his eyes. There was pain in him, like a blister, 
all that was left of some lost yesterday that time had pruned off him. How soon this child must assume his manhood, Alec thought. How soon he must read that form within his mind, that contract of brutal caution, to enter the necessary fact on the necessary line. Please list your next of kin. Halleck spoke without turning. I sense the play in you, lad, and I'd like nothing more than to join in it. But this no longer can be play. Tomorrow we go to Arrakis. Arrakis is real. The Harkonnens are real. Paul touched his forehead with the rapier blade held vertical. Halleck turned, saw the salute, and acknowledged it with a nod. He gestured to the practice dummy. Now we'll work on your timing. Let me see you catch that thing sinister. I'll control it from over here where I can have a full view of the action. And I warn you I'll be trying new counters today. There's a warning you'll not get from a real enemy. Paul stretched up on his toes to relieve his muscles. He felt solemn with the sudden realization that his life had become filled with swift changes. He crossed to the dummy, slapped the switch on its chest with his rapier tip, and felt the defensive field forcing his blade away. On guard, Halleck yelled, and the dummy pressed the attack. Paul activated his shield, parried, and countered. Halleck watched as he manipulated the controls. His mind seemed to be in two parts, one alert to the needs of the training fight and the other wandering in fly buzz. On the well-trained fruit tree, he thought, full of well-trained feelings and abilities and all of them grafted onto me, all bearing for someone else to pick. For some reason, he recalled his younger sister, her elfin face so clear in his mind. But she was dead now, in a pleasure house for Harkonnen troops. She had loved pansies. Or was it daisies? He couldn't remember. It bothered him that he couldn't remember. Paul countered a slow swing of the dummy, brought up his left hand. Clever little devil, Halleck thought, intent now on Paul's interweaving hand motions. He's been practicing and studying on his own. That's not Duncan style, and it's certainly nothing I've taught him. This thought only added to Halleck's sadness. I'm infected by mood, he thought. And he began to wonder about Paul, if the boy ever listened fearfully to his pillow throbbing in the night. If wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets, he murmured. It was his mother's expression, and he always used it when he felt the blackness of tomorrow on him. Then he thought what an odd expression that was to be taken to a planet that had never known sea or fishes. So that was chapter three, or chapter four. So now we'll be moving on to uh, chapter five. Here we go. UA Wellington, standard 10,082 to 10,191. Medical doctor of the Sook School, graduated standard 10,112. Married, Juana Marcus, Benny Jesuit, standard 10,092, 10,186. Chiefly noted as betrayer of Duke Leto Atreides. From Dictionary of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan. Although he heard Dr. Yui enter the training room, noting the stiff deliberation of the man's pace, Paul remained stretched out face down on the exercise table where the masseuse had left him. He felt deliciously relaxed after the workout with Gertie Halleck. You do look comfortable, said Yui in his calm, high-pitched voice. Paul raised his head, saw the man's stick figure standing several paces away, took in a glance the wrinkled black clothing, the square block of a head, with purple lips and drooping mustache, the diamond tattoo of imperial conditioning on his forehead, the long black hair caught in the Sook School's silver ring at the left shoulder. You'll be happy to hear we haven't time for regular lessons today, Yui said. Your father will be along presently. Paul sat up. However, I've arranged for you to have a film book viewer and several lessons during the crossing to Arrakis. Oh. Paul began pulling on his clothes. He felt excitement that his father would be coming. They'd spent so little time together since the Emperor's command to take over the fief of Arrakis. Yui crossed to the L table, thinking, How the boy has filled out these past few months. Such a waste, oh. Such a sad waste. And he reminded himself, I must not falter. What I do is done to be certain my wana no longer can be hurt by the Harkonnen beasts. Paul joined him at the table, buttoning his jacket. What'll I be studying on the way across? 
Ah, the tyrannic life forms of Arrakis. The planet seems to have opened its arms to certain tyrannic life forms. It's not clear how. I must seek out the planetary ecologist when we arrive at Dr. Kynes and offer my help in the investigation. And Yui thought, what am I saying? I play the hypocrite even with myself. Will there be something on the Fremen? Paul asked. The Fremen? Yui drummed his fingers on the table, caught Paul staring at the nervous motion, withdrew his hand. Maybe you have something on the whole Arakeen population, Paul said. Yes, to be sure, Yui said. There are two general separations of the people. Fremen, they are one group, and others are the people of the Graben, the Sink, and the Pan. There's some intermarriage, I'm told. The women of Pan and Sink villages prefer Fremen husbands. Their men prefer Fremen wives. They have a saying. Polish comes from the cities, wisdom from the deserts. Do you have pictures of them? I'll see what I can get you. Their most interesting feature, of course, is their eyes. Totally blue, no whites in them. Mutation? No. It's linked to saturation of the blood with melange. The Fremen must be brave to live at the edge of that desert. By all accounts, Yui said. They compose poems to their knives. Their women are as fierce as their men. Even Fremen children are violent and dangerous. You'll not be permitted to mingle with them, I dare say. Paul stared at Yui, finding these few glimpses of the Fremen and the power of the words that caught his attention. What a people to win as allies. And the worms? Paul asked. What? I'd like to study more about the sandworms. Ah, to be sure. I have a film book on a small specimen, only 110 meters long and 22 meters in diameter. It was taken in the northern latitudes. Worms of more than 400 meters in length have been recorded by reliable witnesses, and there's reason to believe even larger ones exist. Paul glanced down at a conical projection chart of the northern Arakeen latitudes spread on the table. The desert belt and south polar regions are marked uninhabitable. Is it the worms? And the storms. But any place can be made habitable, if it's economically feasible, Yui said. Arrakis has many costly perils. He smoothed his drooping mustache. Your father will be here soon. Before I go, I have a gift for you, something I came across in packing. He put an object on the table between them. Black, oblong, no larger than the end of Paul's thumb. Paul looked at it. Yui noted how the boy did not reach for it and thought, how cautious he is. It's a very old orange Catholic Bible meant for space travelers. Not a film book, but actually printed on filament paper. It has its own magnifier and electrostatic charge system. He picked it up, demonstrated. The book is held closed by the charge, which forces against spring-locked covers. You press the edge, thus, and the pages you've selected repel each other, and the book opens. It's so small. But it has 1,800 pages. You press the edge, thus, and so... The charge moves ahead one page at a time as you read. Never touch the actual pages with your fingers. The filament tissue is far too delicate. He closed the book, handed it to Paul. Try it. Yui watched Paul work the page adjustment, thought, I salve my own conscience. I give him the surcease of religion before betraying him. Thus may I say to myself that he has gone where I cannot. These must have been made before film books, Paul said. It's quite old. That we are secret, eh? Your parents may think it too valuable for one so young. And Yui thought, his mother would surely wonder at my motives. Well, Paul closed the book, held it in his hand. If it's so valuable, indulge an old man's whim, Yui said. It was given to me when I was very young. And he thought, I must catch his mind as well as his cupidity. Open it to 467 Kalima, where it says, From water does all light begin. There's a slight notch on the edge of the cover to mark the place. Paul felt the cover, detected two notches, one shallower than the other. He pressed the shallower one, and the book spread open on his palm, its magnifier sliding into place. Read it aloud, Yui said. Paul wet his lips and his, with his tongue, read, Think you of the fact that a deaf person cannot hear. 
then what deafness may we not all possess? What senses do we lack that we cannot see and cannot hear? Another world all around us. What is there around us that we cannot... Stop it! Yui barked. Paul broke off, stared at him. Yui closed his eyes, fought to regain composure. What perversity caused the book to open at my Wana's favorite passage? He opened his eyes, saw Paul staring at him. Is something wrong? Paul asked. I'm sorry, Yui said. That was my dead wife's favorite passage. It's not the one I intended you to read. It brings up memories that are painful. There are two notches, Paul said. Of course, Yui thought. Wana marked her passage. Her fingers are more sensitive than mine and found her mark. It was an accident, no more. You may find the book interesting, Yui said. It has much historical truth in it, as well as good ethical philosophy. Paul looked down at the tiny book in his palm. Such a small thing, yet it contained a mystery. Something had happened while he read from it. He had felt something stir his terrible purpose. Your father will be here in any minute, Yui said. Put the book away and read it at your leisure. Paul touched the edge of it as Yue had shown him. The book sealed itself. He slipped it into his tunic. For a moment there, when Yue had barked at him, Paul had feared the man would demand the book's return. I thank you for the gift, Dr. Yui, Paul said, speaking formally. It will be our secret. If there is a gift of favor you wish from me, please do not hesitate to ask. I need for nothing, Yui said. And he thought, why do I stand here torturing myself and torturing this poor lad, though he does not know it? Damn those Harkonnen beasts! Why did they choose me for their abomination? And there we go. That's uh, the end of that chapter as well. So there we are. And I think that's where we're going to uh, wrap it up for tonight. Um, like I said, it was a lot of uh, meeting some fun new cast members. That's a lot of what this you know, this opening section is until we get to, um, get to Arrakis, which we will be very soon. We talked about sandworms tonight, so we're getting there. <laughs> so, um, I'll be back, uh, tomorrow and we'll have, uh, some more of this. So, um, everybody, uh, I hope you're all taking care of yourselves out there. Um, I hope that you're enjoying this so far and, um, I'm eager to share more with you guys. So, Stay safe, stay, stay healthy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.